So welcome everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we have a conversation that should be very, very interesting uh, with both the author and the illustrator of the nonfiction graphic book that's called Unrig, How to Fix Our Broken Democracy. This event is brought to you by the Dance Palace, KWMR and Point Reyes Books. We appreciate donations to help support the community center and the radio station and donations will be split between both nonprofit organizations. And we also wanna make sure you support our local bookstore by purchasing the book from them. And now I'd like to introduce our interviewer, Chris Dusser. Chris lives here locally in West Marin and she's an artist, writer and advocate for progressive social change. She hosts conversations with writers and activists on her show Enthusiasms on KWMR. For four years, she has served on the Marin County Planning Commission, excuse me, and previously served on the California Coastal Commission and the San Francisco Commission for the Environment. She was a fellow at On the Commons, a think tank focused on developing the concept of the commons as an overarching analytical structure, organizing across social sectors and disciplines. She is the author of numerous articles and essays and co-edited Living with the Genie, Technology and the Quest for Human Mastery uh, in 2003. She has practiced environmental law and served on the boards of many companies, foundations, and progressive nonprofit organizations, including the Women's Donor Network, the Rockwood Leadership Institute, Patagonia, Mother Jones Magazine, the Rainforest Action Network, and the Further Foundation. So Chris, take it away. Thank you, Bonnie. Welcome everyone. It is a great pleasure tonight to be engaging in this conversation with Daniel G. Newman and George O'Connor, um, the authors of UNRIG. Um, Daniel is a national expert on governmental accountability and money in politics. He's president and co-founder of Maplight, a nonpartisan nonprofit that promotes transparency and political reform. He's appeared on hundreds of media outlets, including CNN, CBS, MSNBC, Fox Business News, I'm dying to know how that conversation went, and NPR. He lives in uh, San Francisco. George O'Connor, the illustrator of, of Unrig, is a New York Times bestselling author and illustrator of the Olympian series, as well as such graphic novels as Journey into Mohawk Country and Ball Peen Hammer. In addition to his graphic novel career, George has published several children's books. He lives in Brooklyn, New York. Unrig is a, just a terrific book. It covers everything we need to know to understand our government. It is uh, a very accessible civics textbook, really. And I, I hope that that doesn't make it sound unexciting because it's actually fascinating, full of wonderful stories that we'll be hearing about tonight. And it also renders uh, our current political environment more understandable. It makes complex issues comprehensible and shows the connection between them from campaign finance reform to voting to the census and more. So Daniel, I guess my first question is, why did you decide to uh, write this as a graphic novel? Was this a form that you have had experience with in the past? I don't think that is necessarily the first thing that would occur to people, but it, to me, is very effective. So I, I've been, for the last 15 years, I've been running this organization, MapLight, as you mentioned, that exposes money's influence on politics to promote political reform. And I met so many people around the country that are actually making this happen, but those stories don't appear in, in the news. And I've also read a lot of books on democracy that are some thick, important books that talk all about the problems of our country and not very much about how the solutions. And so what I wanted to do by writing this graphic novel, working with George, was to come up with something that, that I would want to read myself. It's fun, it's optimistic and, and inspiring, and comics seem like the ideal medium to make that happen. And George, had you had much experience in this field prior to engaging with Dan, Daniel? And, and I'm curious also how the two of you 
got together. Are you guys old friends? No, no, we, uh, we met for the first time as a result of this project. Um, as far as experience in this field, um, in terms, as, as far as doing graphic novels, I mean, yeah, I've done a bunch of those. As far as using graphic novels to talk about politics, no, I was pretty new to that. We were actually, uh, Dan and I were actually teamed up by our editor, a guy named Mark Siegel, who works at First Second Books. Um, I, I do a series, you mentioned in the intro, I'll just mention it here. I do a series called Olympians, which is uh, a retellings of classic Greek mythology in graphic novel form. There's like 11 of those out now. Um, and I was actually doing a tour in California at the time, promoting my books, going to different schools and such. This is just, I love this story. This isn't like an important story. This is like a weird bit of kismet. So I was literally pulling up to this one particular school at the time in the Bay Area when I get a call from Mark Siegel back in New York. And he's like, George, there's this book we're doing. It's going to be called Unrig. I'd really love you to be the artist for it. And he was pitching this as my girlfriend was driving me up to do his visit. And I was like, this sounds great. Let's talk more about this later. I'm about to go to a school visit. And as it turns out, after the fact, I was visiting Dan's daughter's school. So I'm like, <laughs> right? It's like meant to be. This Synchronicity. Is like <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. And, and, uh, and you were working in New York and Daniel, you were in uh, California. How did you guys actually engage? Because there's such immediacy. I mean, first of all, to look at the, uh, the book, and I don't know if, if you want to put up any of the images, but D Daniel is a main character in the book, and you capture his likeness wonderfully well. Um, I just wondered sort of what the process was. Like, Daniel, did you write the book first and then send it to George, or... Was it kind of a co-evolving process? I assume that you hadn't done a graphic novel in the past. I hadn't, and just to show like, so this is the, the introduction from the book and there's me. Hi, I'm Dan Newman. When I was growing up, I learned that democracy in America is about government for the people and everyone's voice is supposed to matter. But over time, I noticed that's not how it works in practice and go into one of the many egregious examples of the the problems with our country's democracy before talking about how to fix it. So I had never written for comics before. I've written a lot of, of our regular textbooks, articles, op-eds, you name it. And so it was, it was a different medium for me to learn. It was really writing scripts. So which the, the emphasis is on short word count to provide room for the pictures and not make them too dense. So I would write the scripts send them to George and he would come back with these rough drafts of what the pictures would be like in really quick and, and rough form. And then I would give feedback on that. And often we go back and forth to like to fine tune the text and the art. And one of the fun things about it was for me because there's such a premium on keeping the word count down, it really allowed time to, to polish and edit every single sentence. So not just put in three examples, but put in only the best example. How can we say this with the fewest words to allow space for George's wonderful art? Well, it, it, it moves along very quickly. I guess that's maybe a feature of graphic novels. It's very compelling and the stories unfold in a way that you want to know what happens. I, I wanna ask you about the, the title because Trump has famously called the system rigged. Uh, you are concurring with that rig riggedness, but also suggesting uh, ways to, to unrig. Uh, did you have Trump in mind when you, when you came up with the title of the book? No, so, so when, people forget this now, but when Trump was running for office four years ago this month, uh, he posed himself as a candidate of political reform. You remember the phrase drain the swamp, like enough with those DC lobbyists. He ran advertisements saying he was going to clean up Washington. And, you know, of course, none of that happened. But, and, but, but he, that message, that desire to change the country so it works more for we the people and not for the corporations, like that is, a, that is very widespread in, in the US. And Trump used it partly to get used that to get elected, but the, the whole idea of unrigging the system goes goes way back. I mean, you think of like, a, what does it mean to rig something, like a rigged poker game, say? So there's, there's 
um, the, the outcome is predetermined, right? Maybe the someone's dealing off the bottom of the deck or the cards are marked. There's something that is, is, is secret that is rigging it in someone's favor. So if you unrig it, you have to do two things. You have to show what's going on, like reveal the problems, but then you also have to change the system, get a fair deck involved. And, and the, the thesis of, of unrig is that the system is rigged to benefit the very wealthiest interests in society global corporations and billionaires. And we go through uh, case after case of how money, our money and politics rules bends the system toward the wealthy, voter suppression, gerrymandering. Uh, but then the book tells how these things not just can be unrigged, but are, and talking about stories from states and cities across the country, which regular people have made these things happen. Well, I think that that's, uh a key element, the key element in the book is the importance of engagement. Because the book is very much about cha changing the rules, which to most people seems like a daunting, if not impossible task. And your book, this book, the one that, that uh, Unrig that you guys did here, actually tells very inspiring stories about how people have successfully changed things. and. Uh, and be, become engaged. You start with which, something which I think is a fundamental issue, clean elections. Can you, uh, you know, talk about what exactly that means and how people have, have uh, dealt with campaign finance reform effectively? Because I think to most of us, it just seems like an impossible task and we somehow need to rely on the Supreme Court and that seems pretty hopeless in and of itself. If, if you want to run for office at pretty much any level of government in the US, one of the first questions that people are going to ask you is, how much money can you raise? Right? How much money can you raise? Regardless of your ideas, community support, leadership, how much money can you raise is a gateway that unless you can get through that gate of raising tons of money, you're not going to have much of a chance of running for office. And, and the number one place to get that money is from interest groups that want something from government. And so then people get elected, they get elected for governor, they get elected for president, uh, they get elected for a senator, and they have all these favors to pay back. And these favors come from corporations and billionaires, and, and it doesn't have much to do with government and the public interest. Now, the way to solve that is have the money come from the public. So that's publicly funded elections. And there's a bunch of states and cities that have this. And so candidates can run for office and win based on their leadership, community support, organizing abilities and ideas. And so you can get people elected that then once they are in office, they don't have favors to pay back to special interests, they represent the public. And, and I tell these stories in my book, especially uh, the one I tell at length is in Seattle. Seattle has this innovative tool called democracy vouchers. And every person in Seattle gets $100 in the mail in coupons, these vouchers that they can give to mayor and city council candidates. And so if you want to run for office in Seattle, maybe you have your community leader, you have great ideas, great leadership, but you don't have a big bank account. You don't know a lot of rich friends. That's OK. You can go door to door telling people that you're running for office and they'll give you democracy vouchers if they like you and use that money to run your campaign and win. Do I remember correctly? I mean, you're not just writing about this. You have actually been involved with this. You were involved in a campaign in Berkeley to uh, uh, get public involvement in fa financing campaigns. I have, and I tell that story in, in the book of, uh, of really back in um, 2003, starting this campaign, with my campaign partner, this uh, terrific guy named Sam Ferguson, who was a junior in college. Neither of us had ever run a campaign before. And we thought we, we need clean elections in our city. It was Berkeley where, where I live still. And so we put measure on the ballot and it wasn't successful, but we brought it back. We got more allies and eventually in 2016, it passed. And now it's part of the city constitution. And so now if you wanna run for office in Berkeley, but you don't have wealthy friends, you're not independently wealthy, you can collect donations up to $50 and the city of Berkeley matches that with up to $300. And so you can raise all the money you need 
from grassroots donation. And then when you get elected, you represent the people instead of the special interests. And you make that point, the, the importance, obviously, of, of representing the people rather than the billionaires, the special interests, um, particularly, well, you make it throughout, but particularly when, the, when you talk about um, the schedule of our members of Congress. Um, and George, I don't know if you have any of those pages uh, handy to post, but I felt uh, that that illustration of the of the schedule was very sobering that a congressman is spent or a person is spending four hours a day more time than anything else than legislating than talking to constituents than learning about policy fundraising and I didn't realize uh, until I saw read it in the book and saw the picture that they're actually in cubicles at a call center and I was thinking to myself how is this any different than an AT&T customer service center set up in Islamabad. I mean, is that the next thing that we're that we're going uh, going to see? That actually these call centers are going to take place in other countries. Um, that was like I will just speak to like the part of the thing that made this such an interesting and exciting project to work on was the fact that uh, I got to learn so much about this. And seeing this this real breakdown on the way uh, like like politicians or people who want to be politicians have to spend so much of their time uh, raising money just to like run, and 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 that that little breakdown that Dan was just able to share briefly on the amount of time that each politician is expected to spend as part of their service that was incredible, and it's interesting having seen it outlined in the book where it becomes very clear Dan is an excellent writer. He's exceptional at kind of just getting just the information that needs to be there. Um, having it underlined for that, I've, I've seen how much more I'm aware of that in the world at large. Um, I don't know how many of you watched the debate just on Thursday night. Um, there was a moment when uh, the president was accusing uh, former Vice President Biden of taking money from big sources and Biden off offers up, he goes, the average donation to my campaign is only like, I think he says $41. And because of the education I received working in this book, I understood why it is so important that you do receive a lot of small don donations. You don't want to be beholden to these big corporate interests or these big, not necessarily corporate, just people with deep pockets. People are going to owe you favors. And it, it's just, it was a nice thing to see it actually played out in in the real world to hear a reference to it. And it's one of the messages that Dan does a great job of underlining repeatedly in Unrig. And in fact, Daniel, one of the things that I really appreciated was your explanations of the differences between um, limited money and unlimited money of, of dark money. Because I, you know, I, I, I have thought, well, I thought there are, there's a $5,000 contribution, individual campaign contribution limit. So why is it possible that somebody like Sheldon Adelson uh, can put 75 million, as it was reported last week, can put $75 million into the Trump campaign? So, or any campaign. So can you talk about um, the, the differences? I mean, how those of us, I mean, for me, $5,000 campaign would be a lot, but I don't think 75 million is so much for Sheldon Adelson. In fact, you have an interesting statistic about, uh, you know, what, pers what these uh, seemingly huge campaign contributions by the billionaires actually represent in terms of uh, a percentage of their own uh, wealth. But this is a whole kind of miasma that you illuminate wonderfully in the book. So there's, this is one of the situations where um, it seems more complicated than it really is. Like there's, there's a vet, the, the people who control the system now, the, the, the billionaires and the corporations and the, and the elected officials who represent them have a real interest in making people think, this is just too complicated, look somewhere else. But it's really not that complicated. There's, there's the the limited money and the unlimited money. The limited money is money you can give directly to a politician's campaigns. You can give about $2,700 to a candidate for president, for example. Uh, but then there's the unlimited money. And since the disastrous 
Supreme Court decisions, Citizens United in 2010 and a series of related decisions that corporations and billionaires can spend as much as they want to support and oppose political candidates. So that's the unlimited money. The caveat, it has to be spent by a separate legal entity than the campaign, but in practice, that's not really a distinction that, that has proven to make much difference. The second distinction is between dark money and transparent money. So transparent money, you know who's giving that money. So all the money gives the candidate campaigns is transparent. Some of the unlimited money is transparent, but then there's a lot of money called dark money or secret money that no one knows who's spending it. And for one example about this, since the, you know, as we, this is about 10 days before the presidential election as we're, we're speaking now, uh, Comey Barrett's uh, hearings just ended uh, for the Supreme Court, uh, $17 million spent to keep uh, Justice Merrick Garland from the Supreme Court, Obama's pick. $17 million from this group, the Judicial Crisis Network, a dark money group, secret money group. No one knows where that $17 million came from, but we do know, thanks to my organization, MapLite's reporting, they came in just one contribution. So we don't know, someone wrote a check for $17 million to, uh, to, to fight um, you know, Merrick Garland being, uh, preventing uh, from being in Scalia's court seat. That's an example of how dark money not only is corrupting our democracy, but like we, the public, have no idea who that person is. Well, uh, and in some cases we know who the, that person or people are to some extent, i.e. the Koch brothers. And I wonder if uh, you want to put up that image of the octopus on page 130 of the book and talk about how it isn't simply the uh, campaign contributions, but it's a whole coordinated network. And it has been going on for many, many, many years. These, these guys have took the long view and they're now seeing the fruits of those efforts. But you go through uh, chillingly and persuasively the long arms of the Koch brothers. I wonder if you um, yeah. could talk about that. Sure, and I'll put this up. So this is, here's a few, few panels here. This right to spend unlimited money to influence elections with the Supreme Court introduced in the Citizens United case. So, you know, most of the rights we have benefit all of us, like the right to a jury trial, the right to freely practice whatever religion we want. But the right to spend unlimited money elections is only a right for the rich. And you can see in this terrific cartoon from George, uh, here you have a justice coming in. Good news, guys. You can spend $1 million for the candidate you like, right? It's, it's like, it's, it's only meaningful if it's for, uh, for the wealthy. So this is a slide, uh, George's slide, the Coctopus. Uh, this is um, the, this chapter in Unrig, uh, which you can read for free actually at our, our website, unrigbook.com. It traces the what you is often called the the radical right or the Koch network. It's a group of six or seven hundred millionaire and billionaire families whose agenda is to stop government from functioning so that they're that they have control over government, and and it traces the the myriad ways in which they do that. I was uh, I learned in your book. I mean. Um, well, let me start over again. I think that somehow lately we've been thinking of John Roberts as the good guy, and let's hope that he continues to be the good guy. But he is somebody who was groomed, I believe, by by the Koch brothers in this network in order to become uh, uh, chief justice. And I did not know that in his younger days, he played a, a very insidious role in terms of vote, voting rights and, and, and the decisions of affecting voting rights. So I wonder if you might talk about that, because um, you also go to, to great lengths about the importance of voting. And I think that, uh, boy, given the numbers that we're seeing this week, people are taking it seriously, because for such a long time, many people have said, eh, what difference does it make? Yeah, also, I'll, I'll do it here illustrated wise. Uh, so we're seeing voter suppression in the country like we've never seen since the post Civil War era, and there, there's so many ways that's happening, and it's predominantly Republican elected officials in the states that are pushing this forward. Now, there's this law called the Voting Rights Act that was passed through um, blood and, and deaths and, and pro, uh, nonviolent protest 
um, out in the um, so during the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s, and it it um, it means that states with a history of discrimination, uh, if they want to make changes to their voting laws, they have to get the Justice Department to prove them first to make sure they're not discriminatory. Because what was happening back then is that the um, the voting rights advocates would overturn some unjust law, and then the state would just pass a new unjust law. And so there really was not real real voting rights for African Americans in particular. Um, so the um, so John Roberts Jr., who's now the Chief Justice, when he was 25 years old, he's clerking for Supreme Court Justice William Rehnquist, a longtime opponent of civil rights laws. He joined Roberts joined the Justice Department under Reagan. He fought the Voting Rights Act reauthorization. So, so this guy's entire career has been dedicated to anti-voting rights. But then 32 years later, now he is Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. You have a Republican appointed majority. And in 2013, they gutted the Voting Rights Act and they, they took away this pre-clearance provision. And so now that's what we're seeing out now. You say like Texas, for example, passes a voter ID law, uh, which, which is discriminatory, makes it harder for people to vote. Uh, if, you have a, uh, you can't, if you have a student ID, that's not good enough. But if you have a gun license, that counts as an okay ID. You have states that close polling places, making it almost impossible to, excuse me, close driver's license offices after requiring a driver's license to vote to make it almost impossible, like if you don't have a car to vote. So this is all going on right now. We're seeing it play out right now, this election season and, and Roberts has been a key part of that. Um, I don't know whose idea it was to use the umbrella, if that was in the illustration, so that was, you know, George, George, George or Daniel, but um, I wonder, you know, George, do you want to talk about the importance, why the umbrella is, is what you used uh, throughout panels with regard to voting rights? Uh, well, I'm going to speak to some maybe kind of larger things than just this particular scene. So Dan and I working in this book, um, Dan did not write a full script in advance. This was a real good learning process for both of us. Uh, when we began working on the book, he'd only written maybe a few chapters because as he mentioned up front, he was kind of learning for the first time how to write a comic script himself at the same time. And I was learning how to draw his comic strips. So we kind of went through this process where some of the first chapters we drew together were the two of us working, you know, out like, I'm like, oh, it turns out like, you can't put that much words in there. And he was learning this. And Dan was an amazingly fast student at this. Like he picked up the way to write comics like super quick, like a snap. Um, and the other thing that was really great about working with Dan was that there would be, so I would get these chapters where he wouldn't necessarily have visual imagery in mind, but there would be certain turns of phrase maybe that he would happen upon. I would read these pieces of text and I'm like, what is the visual cue I'm going to hang them on? What's the sort of thing I'm going to use as the example to like make this difference so we just don't have like 12 pages of like cartoon Dan speaking at us. Um, in this particular one, I wanted to use the example of the uh, umbrella, which I use in a couple different ways in that where it's like protecting various figures from the rain, just like the umbrella as shelter, the umbrella as some sort of like protection. But there's, I would find weird inspirations in different parts of his text. I know one of the ones that Dan is particularly fond of because he brings it up in a few of our appearances. Uh, he was talking about uh, how back in the olden days, ballots were given out by um, <laughs> uh, the different company, like the different political party. Like if you were voting, you would get a ballot and it would only have one political party's things printed on their candidates. And it, that was in, Dan, am I right? That's 1884? Yeah, I'll, I'll bring that up while you're talking, yeah. Uh, and in this particular one, basically because I wanted to draw Dan driving a cool sports car, <laughs> I kind of created a whole scenario where it's Dan traveling back in time, a la Back to the Future, to 1884. And also, I mean, it was a good challenge for me, oh, 1888, not 1884. Uh, I don't draw cars well, so this was my chance to make myself draw cars. It was just a matter of finding some sort of visual cue to hang it on, because comics, this is something I'm quite fond of saying, comics are words and pictures working together to tell a story. You have two different columns in which to convey information. Uh, Dan's words do an amazing job on their own, 
And then with my comics that went along with it, sometimes I would have the comics just kind of support exactly what he was saying. Sometimes I would give a little bit of fancy to the images just to give a little bit more visual uh, variety, a little bit could more you, excitement to the page for people reading so that they'll help underline the message. Could you put up the, the, the image of, of um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg again with the umbrella because it was just so perfect and her comments, maybe Daniel, you, you wanna read it. Uh, I mean, her, her example is so perfect. So I'll, I'll go back to the frame here. So, so the, um, so Congress had reauthorized the Voting Rights Act in 2006 with large bipartisan majorities based on its effectiveness in present, preventing racial discrimination in voting and the need for continued protection against this discrimination. But Robert's court opinion asserted that this protection, this preclearance was no longer necessary. And so he said, well, voting discrimination has gone way down since the VRA has passed. So we don't need this protection anymore. So in Robert's logic, like because the VRA was successful in reducing discrimination, we no longer need it. And so Ruth Bader Ginsburg wrote in dissent, throwing out preclearance when it has worked and is continuing to work to stop discriminatory changes is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you are not getting wet. <laughs> Thanks to the umbrella, of course, right. So well phrased. Yeah, and it's and it provided a terrific image for you to to carry through. Uh, you know, it's a, a simple idea, but works so beautifully. How can you miss that point? Um, so, in a democracy, the majority. I think this is what we have grown grown up learning that the majority is supposed to determine policy, and the minority is supposed to be protected from the tyranny of the majority, but. The current president and George Bush uh, famously lost the popular vote by three million votes. Uh, the Republicans dominated the Republican dominated Senate represents 153 million Americans. The Democrats represent 168 million Americans, and yet these numbers, the the. The, the smaller Republican numbers are the ones that uh, dominate policy and again, most notably, the choices of the Supreme Court. And we in California, the largest state, have 68 times the population of Wyoming, the smallest state, or to take another example in Iowa, Mitch McConnell, arguably the most powerful man in the Senate, represents 4.3 million people, and Diane Feinstein, the ranking minority leader on the Judiciary Committee, represents almost 40 million people in California. And yet McConnell, from his tiny state, is having an outside effect on the lives of us Californians and everybody else. What can we, how can we unrig that? Yeah. So we Americans are justifiably proud of the innovations we've made in democracy because back in the 17 late 1700s right when the country was born like okay we're gonna let's how are we gonna do this we're gonna have a congress we're gonna have a senate we're gonna have a president and here's how it's gonna be elected and they made up you know the the founders of the country made up all these rules that proved to be somewhat models for other democracies that came later but other democracy adopted kind of better technology. Like democracy technology has gotten better since the country was founded. And so in, you know, it's of course you wanna have your, your chief executive elected by who the most people that support him or her, the popular vote, instead of this electoral college system that we have is really a legacy of these olden times. It had its reasons back then, good reasons, bad reasons, whatever, but it had its reasons. Those reasons really don't make sense anymore, yet we're stuck with this 200 plus old technology that needs to be reformed. It, you know, the, the Senate is the, I believe the most unrepresentative, undemocratic body in the country in terms of the unevenness, just as you say, Chris, you have two, two people that have equal votes representing 10 times, one is more than 10 times as many people in the other. And so, part of the, the book here is to unpack these things that, you know, frankly, me growing up, it's just, I just take it for granted. This is the constitution and it's like, almost like it's, 
it's written by the divine pre presence or something. It's like perfect, but you know, it's actually not perfect and it was written by people and it had its flaws even back then. And so part of the goal here is to show how, uh, how things were set up, like isn't so much working and how there actually are approaches to make it work better. And what are some of those approaches that we yeah, should so, be realistically thinking about? Yeah, well, so I'll tell two for, for one is the for the presidency and the other is, is for the Senate. So for the, the presidency, there's this, there's this uh, agreement called national popular vote, interstate compact, and we write about it in the book, national popular vote for means that if uh, states pass a state law, and in California, we've actually passed this law already, that if enough other states pass the same state law, then California will give all its electoral votes to the winner of the popular vote nationwide. Okay? And you know, this is unpacked a little more in the book, but what this means is like if enough other states pass this same law, then after that takes place in the, the, the president who, who, the presidential candidate who gets the most votes across the country, all these states will all give their votes to that person. And it's a way to get the president elected by popular vote without, uh, without a constitutional amendment, which is extremely difficult to achieve. Um, the, the, uh, well, let me just ask you about that one. As somebody who's been involved in politics at every, sort of every level my whole life, I did not know about this national popular vote. And so I'm, it's such a smart campaign, the idea of it as a campaign. It, is there a campaign? Is somebody actually running this and organizing this? Because it just makes so much sense. And I was surprised that I'd never heard of it. There is. It's a great, pretty small organization. It's called National Popular Vote is the organization. You can find it uh, searching for it or go to unrigbook.com and it's listed there. It's, uh, and that's, they're, they're taking, they've been taking this for over a decade, like state by state, winning and winning and winning. I believe there's over a dozen states that have, that have passed this interstate compact. And it's getting to the point where, um, you know, in a, if there's enough energy put into this, it, it could actually tip. And you think of the effect that would have, Chris, I mean, right now, like here we are in Bay Area in California, like I'm getting text on my phone, come to Nevada, help us canvas in Nevada, right? But what if you could just go and get your neighbors to vote? What if you could go to the next town over and get them to vote? I mean, so much, like all of the presidential candidates are focused on a really small group of the, the swing states, right? Maybe 10 states, often less, and all the rest of us are essentially ignored. And so like to, to have that kind of attention lavished on the entire country, why should you vote? Let's get organized to work. I mean, organized to vote in addition to be pro-democratic in a small D democratic kind of way, it would just promote such civic engagement for the country as a whole. And I interrupted you, you were gonna talk about yes, another the example. Senate, right, the Senate. So, um, so the Senate, I, I learned actually, as I was researching the book, um, and probably should have known uh, if I read the Constitution more carefully in high school, that the Senate is actually is the one part of the Constitution that cannot be amended. And there's a clause in there that no, the, no one can lose their seat in the Senate, no state can lose their representation without their consent. Right? So you can't come up with a Constitutional Amendment to make this more democratic. So what that means, but you can add more states. And of course, this has happened many times over US history. And so there was a bill in Congress just in the past year that uh, was passed in the Democratic House to make Washington, D.C. a state. Washington, D.C. has more people than Wyoming, has more people than Vermont, I believe. Uh, and um, and so, um, so I'm an advocate for if the Democrats are win Congress and win the presidency in 10 days or so, that they make D.C. a state. And then you have two more senators, you know, could be Republican, could be Democrat, but most likely will be Democrat. At least that's how the, the district goes now. And I think that, um, you know, people might argue it's like, well, it's 50 states, that's somehow unfair. But actually, we've added states throughout US history. And the more that the Senate is represents the actual people in the country in terms of being more, um, you know, more majoritarian, more majority vote, then, um, then that moves things in a pro democratic way. And as you also point out in the book, that Puerto Rico offers that opportunity and Guam. But it's interesting because I did not know that about the Senate until I read it in the book, because the Congress doesn't enjoy that same protection, which is why it's so important that people participate in the census. And then fascinating, of course, that Trump wanted to 
prevent people from yeah. participating in the census because the census is what determines how many congressional seats there are going to be. That, that's so true. And, and these one of the, the main points of the book is how like little rules make a big difference. I mean, look at the you know, Clinton versus Trump election in 2016. I mean, Hillary Clinton lost that election, uh, lost the Electoral College based on 100,000 votes spread across three states. I mean, 100,000 votes is as many people might go into like a busy fast food restaurant in San Francisco over a couple of days. I mean, it's just not that many people. In, in the in the country, uh, so, so big things turn on on small efforts. So small changes to the census uh, make a difference. Like the rules of how ballots are are counted makes a difference. And and it's important to know that like your efforts, listening to this, like you make a difference too. And I have so many examples in the book of just like one or two people, like I did in Berkeley, or ten people in Seattle made this national model for getting money out of politics, or um, Sylvia in Colorado telling her story of passing. Uh, the national popular vote with 29 other people in Colorado. I mean, it doesn't take that many people, that many dedicated people to make major changes happen. One of the things, I would, if I could jump in really quick. Yeah, please. One of the things that I think is so important about Unrig is that when Dan was writing it, he did make that attempt to include hope. There's so many books we can read about the way the government is structured that just kind of can almost... Um, like they, they can immobilize you with the feeling that you can't affect change. And Dan was really great about making sure like he would have for every single outline, every single problem he outlined, he would find some example of where people either were working against it or had on a local level affected change. There was always some sort of model he was able to point to as like, sure, this looks bad, but look, people have been able to unrig this on some level. And that was such an important lesson, I think, for the book going forward. No, I think that you, you, you end the book with a, with a feeling that there are things to do, there are ways to become uh, involved. Um, and uh, you can, those of you who are interested in the book, you should, uh, and I hope that we've made you even more interested in the, in the book, um, Point Raised Books is carrying it. Uh, so there, there are so many things to talk about um, in limited time. I just wanted to raise this. Uh, Daniel, in the book, you talk about the importance of investigative journalism. I don't know how many people are actually would make that connection. And it turns out that the hoarders, as you call them, the billionaire class, it, are not just the usual suspect that Silicon Valley has joined the riggers, and, and we see this with Prop 22 on the ballot, of course. Uh, last Friday, the Wall Street Journal revealed that Facebook, with sign off from Zuckerberg himself, retooled their algorithm to throttle traffic to certain news organizations, Mother Jones in particular. It was not the first time that uh, Facebook protected conservative disinformation. It routinely lets itself be manipulated by bad faith actors working the refs to undermine democracy and gain a platform for disinformation or hate. Uh, Monica Bauerlein at Mother Jones wrote about this a few weeks ago about how these decisions are connected to so many of the challenges we face as a nation right now. And as much of a fool as I wanna think of Donald Trump as being, sorry about that syntax there, he really got the places to go in with you know, a very sharp stick and worse um, to try and dismantle our democracy. And certainly undermining journalists has, has been in his playbook from the very beginning. Yes, I, I think that the, um, like Donald Trump is not the sources of the problems we're experiencing with our democracy. I mean, to some extent, he is one of the results of it, but the, the threats to democracies have started long before him and they will continue whenever he leaves office. The, in, in writing this book, I thought, well, who are the anti-democracy forces, right? Who is it against voting rights? Who wants more money in politics? And there's an answer to that question. It's this group of people, the wealth hoarders that I that you mentioned, Chris, this, this, billion, this network of billionaires and millionaires. And, and there's a specific reason that they want to disable democracy because they know that in a well-functioning, inclusive democracy, that there are going to be taxes, uh, on, including on wealthy people, to pay for public schools and to pay for healthcare and to protect the environment and do other things that are in the common interest. 
and they they realize that they don't want to be taxed. You know, most rich people like understand paying taxes is just part of what you have to do to be in a civilized democracy. This is a very narrow segment of rich people that they're just like anti-tax, anti-government, and they they don't want public schools, they don't want environmental protection, and they don't they're just kind of out for themselves. And so disabling democracy, you put that on the ballot, nobody's going to vote for it. So they have a secret stealth campaign. It's been exposed in Jane Mayer's great book, Dark Money, and Nancy McLean's book, Democracy in Chains, where they don't come right out and say what they want to do. So that's unpopular. Instead, they do things like attack government, get the Supreme Court to like release more money in politics that give them an advantage. So in a moment, um, we'll take questions from those of you that have joined us tonight. If you um, type your questions into the chat section, Bonnie will uh, um, relay them to us. But before we get to that, and what, what you just uh, talked about, Dan, relates to this, the whole issue of privatization from the schools to the prisons to actually to meter maids uh, and, and how the, this group of people, the hoarders, and it's their sword has many edges. So one of them is in destroying government is basically to give everything over to the private sector. And I think that some people voted for Donald Trump believing, well, he's a businessman and this government really needs to be run by a business, really not understanding that the functions of government and business are entirely different. And the more things become privatized, the more our democracy suffers. Yeah, George, you have any comment on that? Uh, I mean, <clears throat> there is, I, 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 I'm going to agree with you particularly that uh, um, Donald Trump did run on the idea of the businessman and the idea that uh, he would run the country like a business. I kind of wanted to uh, call back to something that I uncovered in my research while working on the Wealth Hoarder chapter. Um, back in 1980, David Koch, one of the Koch brothers, actually ran on the libertarian ticket uh, as the vice president for, on the presidential ticket. He was, you know, you know, trying to become like the actual de facto leader or, you know, second leader of the country. And he uh, did the rare thing of actually totally speaking out and like in his party platform literally listed the things that he wanted to abolish, things that he wanted to see taken out of the government's hand and put entirely into the private sector. Um, while I was researching, I, I actually found online like an actual copy of his party platform. And among the things that they wanted to abolish completely were social security, Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, that's, that's maybe super surprising if you follow this sort of things. Uh, minimum wage and child labor laws. Most amazing to me was public schools and the required education of children. This image here that you're seeing right now that Dan is sharing, this, is, this isn't something I drew. This is the actual published platform of the Libertarian Party. Um, now, Libertarian Party didn't win that election. They got less than 1% of the vote. Not surprising because those things are super unpopular. But this is the same man who then spent billions of dollars organizing into implementing these changes through the, you know, the Koch brothers network. So it's, I know I'm not, I know I'm not directly answering your question. This is just something I'd kind of want to draw an attention to as, as probably the biggest surprise moment that I experienced in the entire book, like seeing this ambition laid out so plainly and something that they were like, this, this was the, literally the platform they ran on. That was astounding to me. And you also, it's also pointed out in the book that by running as vice president, Koch was able to put unlimited amounts of money into the campaign. Didn't yeah. have to be bound by any kind of campaign finance rules. Yeah, it's, it's, it's astounding. And it's, it, it's just one of those things that makes you realize like it's, it's so anathema to the way that most of us think. Like Dan says, most people, even the very wealthy, are happy to pay taxes. They understand it is the price to be part of society. You end up, everybody has to give something. But there are certain people, and they've spent insane amounts of money making sure they don't contribute to the greater good. And it's, 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 it's shocking. 
Well, and the and the the Croke and their the Croke brothers and their fellow hoarders, and you talk about others of them in the book, um, through their drip, drip, drip over time, start to make more convincing arguments to people, even though what they're saying isn't true. Yeah. I think one of the one of the the feedback that we've gotten about the book is people who read that the chapter on the wealth hoarders have a, an appreciation for appreciation for the ability to understand what's happening more. I mean, we've all been assaulted by news headlines, certainly for the four years of the Trump administration, uh, but but even before that, like why are these things happening? And so the, Nancy McLean's book, particularly Democracy in Chains, it ties this all together. It shows like what the, you know, what do all these things have in common, these problematic, these attacks on government, attacks on democracy. And that is a terrific book and I encourage everyone to read it. And you can read the, the 50 page comic version in, in our book as well. I think that of course, that the question arises, well, how can we fight these guys? And you talk about the importance of getting involved. Um, I knew nothing about Uncock My University. I thought that was a terrific story. And you can talk about the fact that, you know, this is again, one of these hopeful stories. People can be effective. They take matters into their own hands and they bring about change. Yeah, Samantha Parsons was an 18 year old college student when she heard about this story in the Friends economic class at George Mason University in Virginia. And the professor in that economics class handed out this text. It said, global warming and other eco myths. And he said, if you wanna talk about debate global warming, leave my class and don't come back. And she thought, wow, this is, what? That's, why did a professor talk like that? And she started talking with other students and professors who were concerned that maybe there was mon donor money biasing what was taught. And so they formed a group on Coke My Campus, which is now na nationwide. They sued the university under freedom of information laws. And the university disclosed that in fact, Coke industry money, a uh, giant fossil fuel company had been biasing what was taught at the university for, for decades. And so that's an example of sort of the, the leverage here is uh, exposing because the, like as George said, what these, this group, this organization, uh, this network wants to achieve is extremely unpopular. And so by exposing that it's going on, that's a way to stop it. That's why the Coke network is so pro dark money, secret money, because they can do things in the shadows. But if we have the opportunity to pass laws, to make money transparent, to make the political money limited, to expose what's going on, and also to spread the word that, you know, the attacks you hear on government, like that's part of a coordinated effort. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of leverage here. And that's one of the things that George and I are really proud of in this book is to to take the story and make it really accessible to everyone. Ronnie, do you have any questions or should we just continue? Yeah, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. Um, except I have one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just because these hoarders are on my mind day and night now. And, you know, I just kind of think about history um, and history repeating itself. And, you know, maybe, maybe these folks have no concerns about that, but, you know, French Revolution keeps coming up in my brain. Um, and uh, I'm just kind of wondering, have you come across anything that might point to, you know, just how far these people really want to go and do they have any sense of what could happen if they take it too far? Uh, I think that, um, you know, the, the sad truth is you look at uh, countries outside the US, I feel like we're in this sort of the middle, there's certain countries that are sort of a lot more egalitarian, sort of better, better, fair democracy. And there's a lot of countries that are a lot more repressive, where like a tiny number of people controls most of the wealth in the country. I, I think that the people pushing for control by wealth are, you know, are, are, are not really thinking of what might happen to them or society, I think they're just out for themselves. So yeah, I, think, I think times have changed enough from the French Revolution that that fear of like, like what you're alluding to, the fear of like, my gosh, is my head gonna be in the chopping block? I feel in like the global world, they, they don't have that same fear. I, I feel like, uh, you know, 
the 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 French monarchy was limited by the travel and the the distance that they could get away in those days. Nowadays, it's it's a big world to be disappeared into, and um, if if you have that level of money, I don't think you're really going to feel like a, an uprising by the people is going to affect you the same way it's going to affect Marie Antoinette. Not that many gu guillotines <laughs> extant. <laughs> We're not uh, advocating guillotining. Be uh, clear about this. That's um, very, that very extreme. So, so um, I, as I say, I think this book is terrific and it should be required reading. They should bring back civics classes. I don't know if they still exist. And this should be the guide. Um, but Daniel, I'm wondering what uh, what your next project is, what you're working on now. Yeah, well, I'll tell you one that, we, that Ma my research in MapLife produces with the League of Women Voters of California that's very relevant right now if you have not yet cast your ballot in California. So you go to Voters Edge, votersedge.org, and you put in your address, it'll tell you everything that's on your ballot, federal, state, local, who endorses, uh, each candidate, uh, the money behind the measures, all nonpartisan. It's a great way to get the information you need as a voter to vote in your own best interest. Um, the other thing I'll mention is that if Democrats do take uh, the Senate and the House um, in 10 days and we have a Democratic president, then it's not an automatic conclusion that they're actually going to do something about these democracy problems. President Obama, when he was first elected, had two years with the Democratic Congress, passed no significant democracy reforms, despite the need for it in the country. Now, in 2019, the House Democrats passed this bill called HR1. They named it one to, to, to indicate that it's the first priority. HR1, this bill that passed the House, didn't pass the Senate, uh, is an amazingly positive pro-democracy reform bill. It supports voting rights. It helps stop gerrymandering, helps get big money out of politics, helps make money in politics transparent, has public funding of election for Congress. It's really a fantastic bill. And so all of us who care about our country, if the Democrats are actually in power shortly in January, uh, we need to pressure them to pass HR1, pass this pro-democracy bill. There's going to be a lot of competing attention for what they should do, but that is the fundamental change we need so that we can solve all of our other countries, all of our country's other problems as well. George, any uh, uh, um, remarks from you about what you're working on now, or next projects? Oh, let's see. I, I'm working on the final book of my Olympian series right now uh, about Dionysus, the Greek god of madness and wine. So it's an interesting time to be holed up <laughs> in my house drawing that. Um, yeah, I'm gonna also just throw some emphasis behind what Dan said too. Um, it's very easy, especially listening to this conversation tonight with our, uh, we, we talked a lot about the Koch brothers and their campaign and how it's really infiltrated the Republican Party. But it is important to remember that no matter what side takes office, uh, the problems of dark money is prevalent on both sides. In fact, uh, there is a chapter of Unrig that you could read right now in The Correspondent about Paul Perry, who was a man who was trying to run for office on the Democratic side of things. And he really details his troubles he had in fundraising. It's it's a problem that both sides of the party have, and that's why we it's the book's called Unrigging the System. It's not un, you know it's not defeating the Republicans or right. beating the Democrats. It's there's some intrinsic problems in the way our democracy is set up about money, and it's it's just important not to not to uh, just kind of focus on the big bad guy and kind of forget that it's there's problems in the system that make that big bad guy a possibility. Absolutely. Well, I, I want to uh, encourage listeners to get the book Unrig at the bookstore here in town uh, to spread the word about it to other people. And I hope that you all will consider uh, contributing to this evening, donations will be split between the Dance Palace and KWMR. Both organizations require or depend on engagement from the likes of us. I want to thank uh, Daniel and George. It's been a wonderful evening, really interesting as far as I'm concerned. I, I hope that uh, everybody tune, tuning in felt the same way. Bonnie, I wondered if you had any final words for us. No, I just want to really thank you guys for, for joining us. This has really been interesting. 
Thank you all so much. Thank you. And Ken, you're not visible, but Ken is uh, the AV guy who made all of this possible. So we really appreciate uh, your behind the scenes efforts. Thank you. It's our pleasure. And thank you to Bonnie for your leadership of the Dance Palace. And, and thanks to all of you for being here. Yeah, next time I'm on the West Coast, I'll have to make sure I get out there to see the Dance Palace in person. The point yeah. raise is pretty yeah. great. <laughs> next time the West be... Coast in like, I don't know, 2030. Yeah, whenever travel is allowed again. And well, we'd, be, we'd be delighted to host you. So yeah, thank, you. thank you, everyone.